recording. All right. So we are recording and we are two minutes. We are starting two minutes late today. All right. So what we'll do first is we're going to take a look at the problem set from the announcement. So let me move this into view so we can all see that. Okay. And I'm talking about this, you know, in the announcement. <clears throat> Not this one. This is this one I just posted today. We'll work on it together today. It's about this one. All right. All right. So I'm just going to go through these here one by one. Um, if you had a chance to work on this over the weekend, great, because this is one way to quote unquote study. Okay, is to see if you can apply what we have talked about um, last week. Okay. Um, even if you cannot find the answer or you're not a hundred percent sure about the answer. That's fine too. Okay, you're know, just being able to keep your uh, maintain the content, you know, and so that you don't forget about what we talked about last week is great. That's the purpose of you know why I gave you guys you know, these <clears throat> activities. All right, so we'll take a look at the first one. For all x in the set of four to six, in parentheses, you know, that's our predicate, which by itself is another quantified statement. There exists y in the set of two, three, such that x mod y equals to zero. So what, what kind of answer am I expecting here? True or false, okay, very good. It's a Boolean answer because this is a condition. It's a statement. It is an expression that returns a Boolean value. It's either true or false, okay, very good. So what do you think is the answer? Okay, the answer is true because you know, for all of these you know, numbers, four, two, or six, <clears throat> um, at least uh, it has at least one of the factors of two or three. Okay, so the answer to the first question is true. The second one looks very close to the first one. The only change is from the existential quantifier, which is basically the same thing as at least one, to the for all, which is called the universal quantifier, which is basically saying the same thing as every or all. So what do you think is the answer to the second question? It would be false because uh, four and two are not dis divisible by three. So two and three are not all factors of every single number in the set on the outer part of the statement. Are we doing okay with this so far? Okay, all right. So the third one, what about the third one? There exists x in the set of 4, 2, 6, such that for all y in 2, 3, x mod y equals to 0. It is true, okay? So how come the second one is false but the third one is true? The only difference this time is the for all on the outside of the entire thing is now changed to a there exists. So in this case, because we have 6 here, so six is a number where two is a factor, three is also a factor. But because of the existential quantifier, I only need at least one of four, two, or six to meet that criteria, uh, criterion inside. Yep, go ahead. So if six wouldn't be there, that is correct. If six is three, if I, if I replace the six with a three, it would also be false. Because three is divisible by, divisible by three, but not divisible by two. Okay. And then what about the last one? I have existential on both, you know, the inner and also the outside uh, quantifiers. It'll be true. Okay, that's an easy one. <clears throat> cool. All right. So are we? Okay with these concepts? Do we have any questions about the concepts themselves? You know, the concept of the quantifier, okay? What is the existential quantifier? What is the universal quantifier and how they work? No questions? Okay, so this is about you reading the notation and understanding what it is trying to say. So what we're gonna do next is exactly the opposite, okay? I have a specific thing to specify, but I want you to help me you know, come up with the uh, equation, not equations, but the formula to express that. So let me go back up to announcements again. <clears throat> and this is intended for an in-class exercise, which means I'm going to 
give you guys, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes or so. Um, and you can talk to your neighbor if you want to. You can talk to each other, okay? But the idea is I want you to solve this in real time in the class. So this way, if you do have any questions, because you're like, I'm not really sure how to apply this blog, okay? Then you can, you know, after the discussion with your peers or your neighbor, then we can talk about those particular questions. So I am going to give, set up a timer and the, oh, okay. So what do you think? 10 minutes, five minutes, anywhere in between? What do you think? Okay, let me describe the problem first, okay? So the problem is I only want to use the notations that we have introduced so far with the set notation, the existential, and the universal quantifiers. I want to be able to specify a set that I call P, um, and I want this to be the set of all prime numbers, okay? So this is the reverse application where I tell you what I want the set to contain, but you have to come up with the mathematical notations to do that, okay? So what do you think, how, how long do you think you're gonna need to you know, kind of get into the whole discussion before we continue the lecture? 10 minutes, okay, so we can do 10 minutes, starting now. So during these 10 minutes, if anyone has any questions, you, know, you can come to me and ask those questions, but I won't be addressing the entire class. And once again, you can work with each other, so you don't have to work by yourself, but that's optional. I'm not gonna take points off <laughs> when people say, but I prefer to work by myself. Then you can go ahead and work by yourself. That's fine too. But if you want to talk to the person next to you or behind you, you know, that's all perfectly okay.
Okay, we got about three more minutes. We got about one minute left. So it can be helpful if you write down your answer. So when I give me give you my solution, you can compare. The solution doesn't have to be unique, which means you know your answer may not look like my answer, but as long as it expresses the same concept, it'll still be okay.
right, we've got about half a minute left. All right, it is time. Okay, so we don't have time for all the groups or every individual to kind of write down their answers on the whiteboard and then compare all of them. So instead of doing that, I'm going to give you my answer and I'll also show you my process, okay, you know, how I find the answer. Because I think the answer itself is important, but how I get to the answer may be important too. Okay? It is up to you to decide whether the process itself is important or not. All right, so I, what I do is I start with the definition. You always want to start with an authoritative, you know, or, you know the, uh, the, the correct definition. So in this case, you know, Wikipedia is not a bad you know, source. You can go to Mathematica, a few other places. They also have you know, good definitions. So in this case, a prime number is a natural number. Okay, so it is a hyperlink for a reason. Okay, so the first question is, do I know what is a natural number? Okay. Greater than one, that is not a product of two smaller natural numbers. A natural number greater than one, that is not prime, is called a composite number, blah, 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 blah. So I think generally speaking, you already know what a prime number is and what is not a prime number. The question is, how do you express it? So what I have done on the side is I, I use Joplin to jot down a few notes here. So a prime number is a natural number. A prime number is greater than one, and a prime number is an integer. Okay, fine. You know, we'll use natural number. Is a natural number <clears throat> that is divisible only by itself and one. Okay. First of all, is this description of prime number consistent with the way that Wikipedia described it, and your understanding of what a prime number is? The key is one is not a prime number, okay? You have to exclude one. <clears throat> All right, so given this, okay, how do we express that? So I'm going to include a symbol here, X, okay, so that we can refer to what number we are considering here. So how do we say that X is a natural number? There are a few ways to do it. Uh, the first way is to utilize the natural number symbol, which is the funky looking N. Okay, that's one way to do it. But if I have not introduced this particular symbol, how are you going to do it? Well, all natural numbers are also integers, and we have talked about integers already, right? So how do we make use of <clears throat> integers um, to describe natural numbers. A natural number is an integer that, that is non-negative because zero is also considered a natural number, okay? So the other way to do it, okay, you know, this is just an alternative. X is in the funny looking Z because that is our symbol for representing uh, the set of all natural numbers. And, okay, wedge, uh, we also need x to be greater than or equal to zero, ge zero. Okay, so that's, you know, these two are basically identical ways to describe that x is a natural number. So if we, if you're going like, okay, but we haven't talked about that funny looking n, that's fine. Use the funny looking z and just put the extra restriction of x is greater than or equal to zero. Basically, it's not negative. Okay, cool. <clears throat> now we have to say that uh, a prime number is greater than one. One itself is not considered a prime number. So it has to start with two. So what are we gonna do here? I think uh, we can uh, just kind of borrow what we had earlier and just say, you know, x has to be <clears throat> greater than one. Would that work? It is an integer, it's greater than one. 
Are we doing okay so far? Okay. What about the last one? The last one is going to be the most difficult one. Okay. So let's find out, you know, how we can express that it is divisible by itself and one. Okay, divisible by one is not a problem because all integers are divisible by one, divisible by one anyway. So we don't have to describe it, okay? You know, that's a given already. The problem is how do we express that it is only divisible by itself and not some other integers? Okay, so I'm gonna see if you guys have any answers. Now the Wikipedia page also said, you know, no integer or natural number is not divisible by any natural number that is smaller than the number x that we are considering, right? So that's one way to do it. So the way I do this, okay, is I can now say, um, let's take a look at this, okay? We're taking a look, a look at this thing here and you can help me describe what it is, okay? So we have a set notation here, um, and we're gonna use y here, y such that, um, what do I want to say about y? Right, okay, so y is greater than one, and x mod y is a zero, and y is, um, we can just use integer. Okay, so we're gonna focus on just this statement here, okay? So let's focus on the right-hand side here. What is that? First of all, what kind of answer is it gonna give us? I'll give you three choices. Is it going to give us a true or false answer? Is it gonna give us a set as an answer? Or is it going to give us a number, particularly a natural number, as an answer? So, hmm? So the, the question is, what are these notations? Okay, you know, it starts, the outermost operator, bar, bar, okay? What does that mean in this class? What is the bar, bar notation? Hmm? The size of a set, yes. It is called the cardinality, to be more exact, but it, that's just a fancy word, okay? It is the number of elements in a set. That's what the bar bar is indicating. All right, so the answer is going to be a number, right? It's going to be a natural number because you know, a set can be empty, so the bar bar notation will return a zero, okay? So we're trying to find out the number of elements, number of elements of a particular set. What set are we talking about? You look at the curly braces, okay? So we are constructing a set on the fly. And what about the qualification? You know, what, what is describing the membership of this particular set? So the set contains members, Y, each member is a Y, such that what? Okay, you just have to read this. X is great, Y is greater than one, easy to understand. Y is a member of the integer set, which basically just means Y is a integer that is greater than one. Is that okay so far? All right. What about in the middle here? X is already chosen as the variable that of the number that we are trying to consider. Is it a prime number or not? So X is already a given number, given integer. So in this case, what does it mean when X mod Y equals to zero? that there's no remainder, or the remainder is zero, okay? In the context of what we're trying to solve here, what is, it, what is that saying? How do we define a prime number again? A number, of an integer that is divisible by itself or n1 only, right? In other words, this set here is basically saying, give me an integer, and I will give you all the factors other than one. Does that make sense? Okay, let's plug in some numbers, okay? Let's just say that I give you x equals to six. 
x equals to 6. Okay? What, are, what is the membership of this set that we are talking about? Yes, we are talking about this part here. Two, three, and six. That is correct. Because two is an integer, it is greater than one, and six mod two equals to zero. Okay, it belongs here in this set. What about three? Same thing. Six mod three is a zero. Three is greater than you know, one. It is also an integer. Ah, meets all the requirement. What about six itself? Same thing. Six mod six is a zero, okay, because it is itself. And um, x six is greater than one. Six is also an integer, also meet all of these requirements. What about 1.5, okay? There are four 1.5s in six. So in a way it is divisible by 1.52. So it's 1.5 in this particular set. Why is it not? It has to be an integer, right, exactly. <clears throat> and by this time, I think you know, everybody should understand what these symbols are representing. What is that? And, that is correct, it's a conjunction, okay? So if anyone is reading this notation and is having a difficulty of understanding what that wedge symbol is representing, it means it's time to review the content, the material. That's basically what it boils down to. There's no way around you know, being able to get familiarized with the symbols. All right, so I think we got everything here now, okay? Because you know, what we can now say, okay, <clears throat> is we are looking at a set, okay? Now, if you want the most obscure way to describe it, okay, we're looking for a set where each member X has to meet the following requirements. Uh, so we're gonna start with uh, this one here. X has to be an integer itself, has to be greater than one. So X is an integer and X is greater than one. Are we doing okay so far? I'm just copying from you know, what we already had earlier, okay? But this time the X is inside the set notation because what I asked you originally was to come up with a set P so that it contains all the prime numbers. It is the set of all the prime numbers. So P equals you know, this particular set. What else do we need? Well, because you know, if we just say that we only need X to be an integer and X has to be greater than one, then we have one, we have two, three, four, five, six, and so on. Well, that's not what we are looking for. <clears throat> so the way we make it more specific is now we integrate what we have figured out here as a part of this kind of expression here. So you don't have to copy this, you know, verbatim, you know, um, I mean, it's getting, it's being recorded right now. So if you're, you know, you, if you want to record this and put it in your notes, that's fine. You know, we, I'm not copying or writing really fast anyway. Um, but it's more important to focus on the concept. So what else do we want? Well, what the other thing that we want is we want this whole cardinality to be one. Okay, so what we'll do, what I'm gonna do uh, is I am going to do something really lazy, which is copy and paste. <clears throat> um, nope here yep okay so I know this is going to look really ugly but that's kind of the point of this entire exercise too is we want the cardinality of this thing to be exactly one all right so let's check whether this works or not P is the following okay it is a set so P is a set of blah 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 <clears throat> every element in this particular set X has to meet all of these requirements. The first two requirements are easy to understand. X has to be an integer, got it. X has to be greater than one, okay. And then the third one starts from here, it ends here. It is a long requirement. But it is really just a repetition of what we talked about already. All we're trying to say is, 
the number of factors you know, in, 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 in the set of integers of x has to be exactly one because we also want to discount one as one of the possible answers. In other words, it's only divisible by itself amongst all the integers. Is that okay? All right. So the question, so if, if the question is, is this easy to read? The answer is no. But if the question is, are there multiple ways to interpret this? Then the answer is also no. In other words, it is a very precise way of describing the set of all prime numbers. But only using the notations that we have already introduced in this class. All right, any questions? Yep. The one is implied. You know, I I did not even bother to specify it's yeah. divisible by one. The part that is that it is divis uh, divisible by itself is already embedded into the bar bar notation. So the bar bar notation starts with oops, I cannot highlight. Start with this bar and it ends with this bar here. Oh, because so the full cardinality is really one. Yes. Yes. Okay. Essentially, it is saying you know the number of integers that are factors of x has to be exactly one. Oh, okay. And we are count. We are we are starting with two, by the way. So one is not included in this. Okay. Now, if you want to include one, you just have to change the cardinality or the restriction to two. Then it is divisible by one and itself, meaning there are two things in this particular set. If you want to uh, change the notation and specify and ignore this part here, that it just has to be uh, non-negative. Okay. Yep. All right, so your answer may not look like this, okay? Your answer may look different, but as long as it captures every factor of you know, what a prime number really is, it will still be okay. So after the class, you know, well, for, you know, if you have any questions about your notation, whether it's gonna work or not, um, you can either send it to me by email, you can come to my office hour, you know, I'll be more than happy to take a look at your notation and see whether it completely captures everything about prime numbers. All right, so how did you guys like this exercise? This is the first time I you know, kind of do something like this, where you, know, you guys talk to each other, I give you about 10 minutes you know, to basically let you guys work on a particular problem. Is it helpful? Is it a waste of time? Are you bored? You find out that you don't like your neighbors. It's okay? Okay, all right, cool. So I can start to do this a little bit more, okay? You know, because I typically do not lecture like this normally, but you know, I can always try new things. All right, so that brings us to back to the notes, okay, which is important. Um, I know most of you or many of you do not read the notes, but it is important to read them, okay? <clears throat> All right, uh, we are done with set notations and we do have homework due on Wednesday. This is just a reminder that we got homework due on Wednesday. And I'm gonna take row first, you know, just because you know, I set the time to uh, 12.45 and now is a good time to do it. So let me unhide it first. So now you can refresh your Canvas shell you know, screen and then I can show you what the access code is supposed to be. The access code is Optimus. I think many of you already know why I chose Optimus. Prime. <laughs> it is quite fascinating that <clears throat> I watched the you know, Transformers when I, I was a kid and the franchise is still around. And I think uh, the Optimus Prime is still voiced by the same person. 
Yep. I can't remember his name, but he has a very distinct voice, right? Autobots transform and roll out. All right, so I'll be done with the uh, road taking activity. Okay, cool. All right. So we're going to go back to the notes and we are moving on to a new topic. We are done with set notations now. So what we are moving on to is functions as sets. Okay. In other words, um, there was one question earlier today that I got from email is, which is, you know, how do I know what to read? Um, and it's from a different class. So it's not, it, I don't think it's anyone from this, any person in this class. Um, so basically, we just move it down the list, you know, the next one, then the next one, then the next one. So we already know, you know, after functions as sets, you know, the next topic is going to be injection, surjection, and bijection. We already know that. Um, so if you can read ahead of time, you know, it's great. But at least, you know, uh, keep up with the lecture content, you know, because, you know, falling behind is definitely not going to be fun for this class. All right, so we are now um, taking a look at functions. And you all know what a function is because the basic idea of a function was introduced in high school. So the, the concept of f of x is a function is already, was already introduced. But what is different about this class is we look at a function as a set of two tuples, okay? So let me give you an example. I know the, the notes can be a little bit boring, okay? This is kind of boring stuff here. So instead of you know, going through the boring stuff, I'll give you some live examples. So this way it's a slightly more interactive and if you want to write down the examples and if you think it's going to be helpful, that's fine too. All right, so I'm going to give you examples of functions, okay? So the first one is, uh, let's say, okay, f of 1 is uh, 17, f of 2 is uh, negative 5, and f of 7 is 23, okay? And I think most of you are comfortable with this notation, you know, f of something, that's some, that something in parentheses is the parameter, and then on the other side of the equation, is the actual value of the result of applying function f to specifically one, two, and seven in this case. So I'll be comfortable with this notation, which is a much more conventional notation of a function, okay? What is strange about this function, there's a few things that are strange about this function, is why? Why is f of 1 17? Why is f of 2 negative 5? And why is f of 7, you know, 23? What about f of two? What, uh, well, we got f of two, but what about f of three, f of four, and f of five? This is completely arbitrary, okay? The way I define this function is completely arbitrary, which, may, which is a deviation from your experience with functions from before this class, because you have trigonometry functions, you have you know, uh, exponent functions, log functions, you have all the functions in calculus, okay? Because I know many of you have taken, you know, at least your calc one already. So you got, you know, f of x is x squared and so on and so forth. Yeah, we are not dealing with those functions. We're dealing with functions that are discrete, which means I can define the function any way I want, okay? So this particular function only maps three specific values to something else. In other words, it specifically maps one, to a value of 17, it maps two to a value of negative five, and seven to a value of 23 for no apparent reasons whatsoever, okay? So the other way to, because the whole point of this discussion is the notation of functions. How do we denote a function? So in this case, I can also use this really kind of funky way of defining it. I can say that f is a set, okay? It's a set of, oh, you guys cannot see it. Give me a second, scroll up. There we go. So it is a set of two tuples. Can someone remind me what a tuple is? The beginning of items where the order matters. Where the order matters and you can have duplicate items within a tuple. 
So one one is perfectly okay as a two tuple, but you cannot have one and one in a set because all elements in the set, each one has to be unique within the set. All right, so in this case, it is a set of two tuples, one to 17, two to negative five, and seven to 23. That's the notation. Are we doing okay so far with this concept? I'm just changing the way that we write a function. What is mapped from what to what else, okay? It's basically a tuple, two tuple is a mapping. It is mapping a particular value from what we call the domain to a value in the codomain, from the domain to the codomain, from the domain to the codomain. Um, in your other math classes, the term codomain in this class is also called range. So if you remember domain versus range in your other math classes, same thing here, except I don't call range range, I call it a codomain. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so also in this case, we can also say this, okay, f is a function, okay, that maps <clears throat> from the set of one, two, seven, which is our domain, and we use um, right arrow to the set of the codomain, which in this case is 17, five, negative five, and 23. All right, so let me clarify what each line is trying to specify. The last line here is basically saying f is a function, where, okay, I have an extra comma. Let me get rid of the extra comma first. <clears throat> so this line is basically, I can even write here, f is a function where the domain is the set uh, one, two, seven, and the co-domain is the set of negative five, <clears throat> 17 and 23. So that's what this notation is saying. It does not tell us, the last one, does not tell us which value of the domain maps to which value in the codomain. All it is saying is, we have a function, this is the domain, this is the codomain. That's what the third line is trying to say. The second line does not say it's a function, it, sim it is simply a set of two tuples. It does not tell you how to interpret f other than the fact that it is a set of two tuples. So are we okay with the notations, the concepts? All right. Yes, go ahead. All right. So let's 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 find out. What is what do these symbols mean? The braces. What what do they mean? It means we have a we have a set. Very good. So in a set, when I enumerate items in a set, what what makes a set a set? What is one of the things that makes a set a set? The items in a set are not ordered. So that means you know as long as a member is listed, where it is on that list does not matter. So remember that, okay? There's no intrinsic ordering of items within a set. Cool, all right, so this is good, okay? You know, I like it, you know, because when you guys are asking questions, it means you know, you're processing it and you, you may have forgotten certain things that we talked about already, but that's okay. You know, because at least you're thinking about, but what about this, okay? And that's also why I intentionally wrote it in a different order, is to see if people ask questions about it, okay? All right, very good. So I think we are good with functions, you know, or at least the notation of a function. So the next thing we're gonna do is to say, but there are all kinds of sets of two tuples. What makes a function a function? Okay, so that's the next thing we want to we want to talk about. 
I'm going back to my notes first, you know, just to point out you know, where we are at this point. Um, section two just talks about your know, tuples, which we just we just talked about tuples you know, today. Um, so it's not, you know, I think I got it covered. Um, and then section three talks about you know functions in general and functions in this class. So in mathematics, in your, in your all of your other math classes, you typically see the definition of a function like f of x is 2x or f of x is x squared or f of x is the square root of x, but not f of x is x to the power of negative one, negative one half. Wait, hold on a second here. Jack, what did you just say again? f of x equals to x raised to the power of 0.5 is not a function. Okay, I just said something, you know, I'm not sure how many of you got a mental picture of what I just said, so I'm going to write it here. f of x is x raised to the power of 0.5 is not a function. Hmm. Why? <coughs> Why do you think that is the case? Yep. Well, there's that, but I can restrict, you know, what x you know can be, right? So let's just say that x is four. What is four raised to the power of 0. 0.5? Two and negative two. Okay. So there are two answers, and a function can only map something from the domain to one thing, one and only one thing in the codomain. That is a restriction. Okay, so I'm gonna write it down, okay? Now, you might want to write it down too or highlight that portion in the notes, okay? Because, you know, I'm not gonna share my notes. Too late, right, because I'm already projecting and recording the whole lecture. But the whole point is, if you write your own notes, it's going to help you more than just reading my notes. Okay, so I'm just going to ahead and write this. So a function can only map a value from the domain to one and only one value in the co-domain. And that is why, you know, this is not a function because if I apply four here, then the solution is it can be two or negative two because the square of two is four. The square of negative two is also four. Okay, so in that case, I would, I would map one value to two different things. Yep. Then it'll be okay. Yep. And that's the difference between raising the power of something to one half versus the square root symbol. The square root symbol only looks at the positive, or the non-negative root. All right, okay. <clears throat> so now the question is, uh, do we know enough stuff at this point to specify that a function can only map a value from the domain to one and only one value in the codomain? Okay, so let's start you know, thinking about that a little bit. But I'm going to state something that is obvious, okay? If f is a function that maps from, um, I'm just going to use you know, variables here. Uh, x is a set, and it maps to y. Then f So let me finish typing first and then we'll talk about it because it's hard to read when I'm still typing, you know, because the rendering keeps changing all the time. Okay, so does that make sense to you? So the first thing is we have to figure out what does that mean, okay? What, is, what does this mean? If, if you want this to be more cryptic, let me make this more cryptic. The reason why I like to make things more cryptic because it really then tests you whether you understand the symbols or not. So I am just going to get rid of this stuff here, change this to a 
right arrow. All right, okay, now it is a little bit more cryptic because on one side here, it is a condition that says you know, f is a function where x is a domain and y is a codomain. This is basically, this can be false, okay? I can give you a set f where it is not a function, okay? So in this case, I'm saying, let's just say that it is the case, okay? f is a function where x, which is some kind of a set, is the domain, and y, which is some kind of set, is the codomain. <coughs> let's say that is the case. It implies that f is a, oh, what does that mean? Subset. Oh, wait, but there are two things about subset, right? There's subset and there's proper subset of. Which one is this? Just regular subset. Okay, very good. It's a subset of x times y. What is times? What is, how does it apply to the concept of sets? Is it actually multiplication? No. What is it? Cartesian product. Very good. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Because f has to be a two-tuple, where in each uh, two-tuple, the first item has to come from the domain, and then the second item has to come from the codomain. So I hope this makes sense kind of in an intuitive way, okay? Okay. Let's, let's take, a look, take a look at an example, something that we have worked, worked with up to this point, okay? So what we'll do is we are just going to take a look at this example that we just looked at earlier. Um, y, T, dollar sign. Okay. All right. So given that this okay remember this we talked about this earlier right <clears throat> that means okay this I'm, I'm i'm already regretting my decision because you know this uh the cartesian product is a little bit long but since i already i started this path i'm gonna i'm going to finish it okay f is a subset eq all right what is the cartesian product of the domain and the codomain in this case. Now we start to understand why I said, you know, I'm starting to regret it already. <clears throat> so can someone tell me what is the, how many items am I expecting in this particular set that I'm constructing? It is not the empty set, okay? This is just a placeholder. How many items are supposed to be in this particular set? I'll give you four possible answers. Zero three, six, or nine? Nine, because nine is three times three. For every element in the domain, it can potentially map to any of the three elements in the codomain, okay? So that means that the full membership of this entire thing is one, 17, one, negative five, one, uh, 23, and then we have, um, okay, I can, I probably can do this really quick with a tricky VI command, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Negative 5, and then 2 to 23, and then finally, we got 7 mapped to 17, potentially, uh, 7 to negative 5, and then 7 to 23. There we go. So that is the full membership of the Cartesian product. So the question is, if you look at the F that we defined earlier, which is way up here, is this F really a subset of the Cartesian product that we just created? Well, let's double check, okay? How do you know whether it is a subset or not? Everything in F should be found in the Cartesian product, 117, Mm, let's see, 117, yep, got it. 2, negative 5, got it. 723, got it. 
Now, the Cartesian product contains some other stuff that is not in F, but that's perfectly okay, because I only claim that F has to be a subset of the Cartesian product. I didn't say that it has to use up everything. Are we still doing okay so far? All right. Okay, so now we're getting back to the earlier thing that we talked about. A function can only map a value from the domain to one and only one value in the codomain. So I'm going to give you some examples where they are not functions, okay? So I'm going to show you examples of things that are not functions. Uh, these are not functions. All right. So using the same three elements of the domain and the same three elements in the codomain, I can show you this. This is not a function because it doesn't map anything, okay? Because in order for something to be a function, it has to map, oh, okay, this is my bad, okay? This is my bad, but it's also a good um, opportunity to talk about why natural language is sometimes problematic, but it is my error this time, okay? It, is, it has nothing to do with the language. I should not have chosen A, I should have said every. What is the difference? <coughs> when I say a value versus every value, what is the difference? Okay, all right, go ahead. Could be just a, at least one specific value. <coughs> so how does that relate to quantifiers? The way I say it here, map a value, which, which quantifier are we supposed to use here? So we got two quantifiers. One is called universal and one is called existential. So when I say a value, which one does it map to? Existential. When I say every, universal. That's right, okay? So this is my mistake, which I'm gonna fix it leaving behind evidence that I made a mistake because it is important, okay? Because the correct thing to say is every. And of course, in that case, you know, only, so I'm gonna change the sentence structure just a little bit here. A function maps every value from the domain to one and only one value in the codomain, okay? Now, the reason why I spotted my own mistake is because when I'm looking at this here, I go like, well, okay, this is not really the best example, but it prompts me to go back to the earlier thing, go like, wait, hold on a second here. I should say that to every element in the domain and not just say a particular one, okay? All right, so does everybody agree that the empty set does not map anything? And therefore, this one is given, okay? Yo, okay, I have, to, I have to qualify these statements a little bit here. So given the domain, potential domain, okay, potential domain is one, two, seven, and the potential co-domain is um, 17, negative 5, 23, okay? All right, so this, this is much better because you know, now it is very clear what we're considering. Because if the potential domain is one, two, seven, this does not map anything. And I need everything in the domain to be mapped to something in the codomain. Does everybody agree that the empty set does not map any of the values in the domain to anything in the codomain? I think that's a pretty clear thing. <clears throat> okay. So let's go ahead and map something. So we'll say, let's map a one to negative five, um, two to 23, and then we have seven 
to negative five. And then we have two to negative five again. Okay. So what about this one? I claim that this is not a function. Why is it not a function? Exactly. Very good. Two maps to 23. Two also maps to negative five. So that means the statement of every value, every value from the domain should map to one and only one value. That rule is broken. One and only one is very clear, exactly one. But in this case, two maps to two different things in the potential codomain, and therefore this set cannot be considered as a function. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the next one. <clears throat> Uh, let's try 123. Oops. Okay, that needs to be in the tuple. Um, 1, negative 2, 7, negative 5. And that's it. Why is this one not a function? Go ahead. And specifically, which one is not mapped? Two is not mapped. Very good. So in the last, in the third example, which is the same reason why the first one is not a function, is uh, one is good, seven is good. What about two? Two is not mapped to anything. But since you know, in my original statement, I said every, and this does not play by those rules because not every element in the domain gets mapped to one and only one thing in the codomain. So are we still doing okay so far in the examples of what is not a function, okay? So now we'll, we'll talk about what, are, what, you know, what can be functions in this case, okay? So we'll say these are functions. <clears throat> so once again, we'll take a look at some examples. And we'll have, oh, this one looks silly. 2, negative 5, 7, negative 5. I say that, yeah, this is a function. Why? Okay, first of all, does anyone have the doubt that this doesn't look like a function? It doesn't seem to follow all the rules. Well, okay. So for those of you who are thinking, yeah, but they're all mapping to the same thing. What about the, the other two things in the code domain they're not mapped to? Well, but did I say anything about every element or every value from the domain has to map to unique elements in the code domain? No, I didn't say anything like that. So they can all map to one thing in the code domain. Also, in this particular statement here, did I say everything in the code domain has to be mapped to. No. So that means you can have a lot of extra stuff in the code domain and no one in the domain is mapping to. That's perfectly okay. Not a problem. Is that okay? All right. So given these examples, I want to have a description of this particular rule, okay? You know, where the mouse pointer is pointing to. I want to describe this. <clears throat> in a mathematical way. How can I do that? So I want to be able to specify that everything in the domain maps to one and, on, one and only one thing in the codomain. So what mathematical expression am I going to use to do this? Um, and also, you know, this is not necessarily the only way to do it. I just need to think of one way to do it. So looking at the time, I'm not going to give you another 10 minutes you know, so that you guys can work it out because it's in the notes anyway, okay? So I'm going to do it, and I'll do it, you know, kind of in Joplin. So if you want to just read it from the notes, you know, that's perfectly okay. 
All right. So in order for f to be a function where x is the domain and y is the O domain, the following must be true. Okay. So this is going to be one rather long, you know, uh, expression. So I'm going to begin and end with parentheses, you know, just so that when I type between the parentheses, it doesn't, you know, do all kinds of wacky stuff in the rendering. It will still do certain things. It, it's just not as bad. All right. So the first one is easy. Uh, F has to be a subset of the Cartesian product between X and Y. Okay. That one is easy to express. So we'll just say, okay, so F has to be a subset EQ of X times Y, okay, the Cartesian product. Okay, this one is pretty easy to understand, and we talked about it already. But there's something else that we also want to express. So the way I construct this is something has to equal to one. The equal to one here has to do with one and only one. Is that okay? Because if I were to say at least one, it would be greater than or equal to one. If I were to say up to one, it would have been less than or equal to one. But since I said one and only one, that means it has to equal one. Hmm? I'm not an English professor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether only one can be interpreted as at most one. So I suppose this is a question you can ask your English professor. If, you have, if you're still taking English classes, ask the English professor and ask, is it possible for someone to understand only one as at most one? I'll give you an example. Only one of us get to walk out of this room alive. <laughs> okay? Does that imply that there has to be one person walking out of this room alive, or does it mean that everybody can die in, in this room? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not an English professor, so but if I say one and only one person gets to walk out of this classroom alive, then it is pretty clear. Expect exactly one person. Is that okay? I know that's a terrible example, but you know, that's, what's hap that's what's bubbling up in my mind you know, when, I'm, when I was trying to make an example of, you know, of, that, of that phrase. So, okay. So now the question is, um, okay, we know, we know it's exactly one, so we are counting, okay? So when it's counting, we learned this trick earlier, right? You know, because we said a prime number is divisible by itself, only by itself, and one. And we use the uh, bar bar notation, the cardinality, as a way of quote unquote counting. So maybe we can do it here too, okay? So I just kind of put in the bar bar notation and also automatically put in the set notation because we are basically constructing a set of, okay, we are counting these things and we want to make sure that there's only one and only one of those things. Is that okay? So this, this is how my mind works, okay? You know, I'm just constructing the thing you know, la one layer at a time. Okay, so when we talk about a set notation, we have to describe the membership of the set. So in this case, I'm going to say in the membership of this set, there's U, V as a two tuple. Every member of this set has to be a two tuple where U is the first member and V is the second member. Such that, okay, so what do we have as requirements? Um, we don't have to specify this has to be part of the Cartesian product because we got this already, okay? So we know that every member of F is, um, a two tuple where the first item comes from the potential domain and then the second item comes from the potential codomain. So I don't have to re-specify that membership. Um, okay, so now we go like, okay, but what, what are we counting here? And uh, we are also missing a universal quantifier at the beginning of this entire thing. 
So let me just put a universal quantifier here for all uh, u. Okay. Okay. Why is there a for all? Okay. Let me go back to the uh, original statement and you guys can tell me why I use a universal quantifier. So we are looking at the original English description, which is up here. Which part of this suggests, hmm, maybe we need a universal quantifier somewhere? Every. Okay, very good. Okay. So the every is saying, okay, don't just look for one thing in the domain that maps to exactly one thing in the codomain. Everything. Okay. If you pick anything in the domain, that thing has to map to exactly one thing in the codomain. Okay. And that's why we have the universal quantifier down here. So for every u, and I need to be specific now, and for every u what, where, where does u come from? For every u in the domain. Okay, because now I'm restricting, because without, um, for all u as an element of x, without the element of x, it becomes for everything in the entire universe, including all the things that are not in x. It's like, no, no, we only care about things that are in X because X is our potential domain. So we have to say for every U in the domain, okay, so U is already what we call bound by the time we get to this expression. So the U is chosen here and it's referred, is referenced here. So the, the only variable here is V. V can be anything in the, anything in the potential codomain. So now we look at this, and actually, that's about all we need. We just have to say that. What does that mean? So <clears throat> if I were to explain just this part here, which is to the right-hand side of the conjunction, what it's trying to say is for every element in the domain, Okay, every value in the domain. Um, if you count the number of two tuples corresponding to it in F, which means you know, every two tuple in F that starts with this particular domain element U, and it can map to anything in the codomain, if you count the number of these two tuples, it has to match exactly one. Okay. So I'm just going to pause here and see if there are any questions. Yes or no? And if you're, if you're thinking, oh gosh, this is almost like taking a whole, taking a class to learn a new language, then the answer is yes. This is a class of learning a new language. It is the mathematical notation. Yep. Say again? So the, okay, think about this as a, as a loop, okay? <clears throat> when you look at for all, it really is a loop that is iterating through all the elements of whatever set that you are using as a, as a restriction, okay? So this is a loop and basically it's iterating every single value in the set. So the other part here is inside the loop, which is basically saying once the loop has chosen which specific element to look at, we are now constructing this particular set here. The construction of that set is basically looking at the entire F and ask, okay, give me all the two tuples in F that starts with this particular value that I have chosen for you and count the number of two tuples in F that starts with that particular value of U. But we want that count to be exactly one in order to match the one and only one requirement. So is that helping? Okay. 
I think one thing you can try to do is it's hard to do in this class because you guys have never learned uh, JavaScript. But in JavaScript, there is you know set notation, and as a result, this can all be coded. You can actually write a program with three parameters. One parameter is a set of f, one parameter is the set of x, one parameter is the set of y. And this entire expression here can be done using JavaScript code. Um, I can illustrate it next time if there's any interest. Um, and we are meeting again on Wednesday. So for those of you who want to give it a try, okay, you can just use pseudocode too, okay? If you want to use pseudocode, that's fine. Uh, the only thing that is missing from C and C++ is the, the concept of a set and the concept of iterating you know, every member in a set. So you can kind of invent your own syntax to do that. Like, okay, this thing has a type of a set and this is a special for loop that can iterate all the members in a set. So given that that is possible, okay, then you can go ahead and see if you can, you know, basically it's just pseudocode this entire thing, express it in sequential logic that you are already familiar with. Because that can really help you understand the concept because you're connecting something that is a little bit abstract and weird looking in this class to things that you already know, which is C and C++ programming. Now, I lied a little bit when I said C and C++ does not have the concept of a set. C++ does have a template class of a set, but it's not particularly useful in this case because a set is a template class which is doable, but it's really kind of hard to say it's a set of two tuples, you know, because a tuple is kind of like a vector of only two elements. So you can express that in C++, but it's, it's really kind of unwieldy to do it in C++. So on Wednesday, I will give you the JavaScript you know, code that can do exactly that. Um, but at least you get to see the overall logic of how to do it sequentially. Uh, the syntax is not a big deal. You know, JavaScript is very close to C, um, very much the same kind of notation. The only thing that extra in JavaScript is it has set as one of the primitive types, which is really handy sometimes. All right, so this is the end of today's lecture. I will see you on Wednesday and try to read the entire module that I'm on right now. So that way on Wednesday, when we continue with this discussion, you know, you can pick up things a little bit fast, faster and absorb the content. All right. Have a good day.